Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is episode 22 of Integrated Infrastructure, and this week I'm talking to Alistair Coolstock, Director of Sustainability at KPMG. Alistair is passionate about sustainability, not just in physical buildings and infrastructure, but throughout our society and economy. In this episode, we talk about Alistair's very busy year, not just dealing with lockdown and COVID, but completing his own sustainable building project and selling his company and becoming part of the team at KPMG. We talk about his family holidays in the English countryside and how they set him on his path to a career in sustainability. We talk about the need to value our natural capital more when developing our cities and places and spaces. And we talk about his interview with Jay Samet and his book, The Conscious Business. We cover a lot of ground in this podcast and I hope you enjoy it. Please remember to like, share, comment and subscribe. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Alistair. Alistair, welcome to Integrated Infrastructure. It's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, as always, it'd um, be awesome if you could jump in, tell us a bit about who you are, uh, where you work, and, uh, and what you're all about. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, my name's Alistair Coolstock. I'm a director in the sustainability division of uh, KPMG Australia. Uh, my background is, uh, is all about property and infrastructure. That's where I've, where I've come from and where my roots have been. Uh, and uh, we get involved in assisting clients and developers in particular uh, do better, more efficient, more healthy buildings, essentially. So that uh, involves any part of the life cycle of a of property, right from uh, feasibility, case studies, all the way through to operation. Fantastic. Um 2020 has been a bit of a full-on year for everybody, hasn't it? But um, um, not not only have you dealt with working from home and you know challenges maybe that your clients have had, but you've actually sold your business to KPMG this year. Um, can, can you tell us a bit about that and how how, how it's all come together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely been an interesting ride for everyone. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, ours definitely has. A, probably um, some extra tenants in there that, that would make it um, a bit more interesting, I guess, than a, than a usual year. Uh, so we, we started out three or three and a half or so years ago, um, myself, John Louis, uh, and Mark Lister, in setting up uh, Action Sustainability, and also Danielle Mulder was involved right at the very start of the process. Um, I got a chance to join them early on in the piece, and um, we, we're tracking well. We've got some good clients working hard in, in sustainable procurement as well as human rights and, and in the property infrastructure space. Mm-hmm. Um, but as anyone knows who's ever started a business, it's, it's pretty hard yakka at the, st- at the first few years. And, and we were all at the stage where we were thinking, you know, we, we want to make a big difference. You know, there's, there's growing concerns around sustainability or it has been for, for, for decades now, but there's, you know, there's a bit of moment, uh, momentum behind actually making a difference. Mm. And um, we, were, we were just, you know, thinking back on the last three years and what we've done, what we've achieved, but how, we, how can we ratchet it up? And as you know, when you're a small SME of eight people, as we were, you got to drink a lot of coffee to get around your, your clients and business development. You know, a lot of coffee. To, to get in there, yeah, get the work in the door. Mm-hmm. And so we started thinking about what is the next steps? You know, we're, we've, we've gone through a successful three years. We've got some great mm-hmm. tier one clients. Um, but how can we ratchet it up? And it was literally a bit of a passing conversation with uh, Richard Buller at KPMG Banara mm. uh, that started the process off and in, in even sort of considering what that might be on, as to how we could potentially, I mean, originally we were thinking, well, how can we scale? Do we need capital? Do we, mm. you know, do we... ...in the deep end and get some, get a... Uh, you know, a passive investor behind us or something like that. But as I say, the conversation came up with Richard Buller. We had um, we had some mutual, you know, understandings around a vision of around where we want where we wanted to go. Our sustainable and procurement and human rights team fitted perfectly with their with with what Richard does in his in his Banara team. 
Uh, and you know, if you, after a few conversations, we just thought, well, yeah, this makes sense. You know, we can make a big difference, make a bigger impact if we're in part of a bigger team. My sustainable uh, property and infrastructure uh, experience and uh, um, and team fits really, really well with the KPMG sustainability team, of which there's about 40, 45 strong over there across mm. the across Australia. They predominantly do a lot of strategy work with big organizations and also assurance and sustainability assurance. And so we fit really well to assist them in complementing their strategy work and underpinning some of the targets that are being set. Yeah, fantastic. So that was probably back in September last year that the original conversation started. And then, mm. you know, after a lot of due diligence, a lot of conversations, we eventually uh, completed in March, which was certainly an interesting time considering that was when the COVID was starting to emerge as a, as a mm. real issue. And we literally had two weeks to get our feet under the desk before we're all going home, working from home. So uh, that's been, it's been good, but it's probably been, it, it's been challenging for probably the property infrastructure team a little bit more so than the, than the our KPMG, our human rights and supply chain team, mm. because they were already working same, same type of scope, same type of work fitted straight into the Banara team, so already working on projects. Whereas with my team, we already had a, t- a ton of project deliverables to to um, to keep working on. So we we're quite um, separated from the main sustainability team because we were still still got our own workload. Um, however, they you know a great team, a great bunch over there, and you know it's taken a, a little bit longer because of that that um, that transition. Uh, under well, working from home, uh, but uh, but yeah, we're 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 fully ensconced now in uh, in the in KPMG and and looking forward to you know getting involved in some of the big projects that they they uh, they get yeah, uh, they come across the desk. Congratulations! It sounds. Um, I mean, um, it's uh, it's fantastic, and we we work with KPMG and um, um, the, um, the the variance of, of the work that they do, especially within property and, in, and infrastructure. That I don't think many people know the, the scope, the, the the breadth of, the, of, of what they do. Um, mm. So I think it's a great move, and uh, yeah, congratulations. That, that's Thanks. not been your only distraction this year, though. You just made it. You just let me know before we started recording, didn't we? That you've got a, a, a side project as well. Yeah. So we. Uh... Just to add a little bit of extra um, you know, stress to the whole year, we decided about a year and a half or so ago that we were going to build a little two-bed residence out the back. And being a sustainability consultant, I really wanted to make sure that it was sustainable rather than just minimum minimum standard. Uh, you know, the residential sector, single resident sector, is probably the laggard of the of the sectors in the building industry. I would suggest. And uh, so I really wanted to demonstrate a couple of points. I wanted to demonstrate that we could net zero was easily achievable uh, with some very simple construction tweaks just to change to look at thermal bridging and permeability. And so I started this process about you know, so over a year ago and I got some great um, companies involved that really helped out through the process like ProClima, um, Viridian, um, Kingspan, Easy Windows, and Alliplast. Stiebel Eltron and another and Passive Analytics are the, the, some of the key ones that really assisted in the process. Just to, you know, Jesse Clark's are fantastic at around um, with ProClima products and wrapping a building up nice and tight, and but mm. also making sure you're you um, you're doing it in a way that you're not create causing issues. If mm. you're if you're if you're wrapping a building too tight, but then you've got thermal bridging issues, then you might create condensation issues, which then leads to mold. So it's not straight. It's not straight. It's a simple process, but it's not that straightforward. You just need to watch out for certain details. So that's been going on in the background, and uh, that completed in May last year. So yeah, pretty pretty busy. A uh, little bit of you know worked really really um, well with the with the building with the builders to to assist the process as well. Uh, and you know it's new for them to go through this sort of process, and they're very simple tweaks, but. You know, just looking at UPVC windows with double glazing in them, for example, mm. just makes a huge difference in terms of you know, your thermal properties of your envelope. Yeah. Uh, so um, that going on in the background really um, add, just added a little extra. Uh, kept you busy. <laughs> so, yeah, kept me kept me busy whilst whilst trying to you know spend some time with the family as well when you've got yeah. two boys. 
it was pretty full last year. So uh, well done, well done, and um, um, it's 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 fantastic to hear you've got that you you know you're living and breathing and and you know really you know um, um, you know sort of. Um, trying to think of the right expression but um you're putting your money where your mouth is in terms of the industry and you know really trying to do something yourself but um but where did the um, uh, sustainability begin for you where, where, where did it all start how, how did you get into the industry mm. it's an interesting one i've been trying to think about how this you know it all fitted together and mm-hmm. i guess it really stemmed back from from my holidays when i was a, when i was a kid in the uk Mm. Uh, my parents didn't like going flying, didn't like going across on European holidays. So we used to go out to country cottage holidays in, in you know, on the moor, moors, somewhere like Dartmoor or uh, Yorkshire Moor or uh, mm. up in the Lake District. And so holidays were, every year were full of times out in remote areas, mm. walking across, you know, the wilderness. It's sometimes probably the majority of times when you look back on it was in the rain. <laughs> typical <laughs> English weather, but um, but I think that's where I really got my affinity for 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 nature and for mm. having that headspace. You know that quiet time, the walking mm. across these beautiful places with no distractions, mm. surrounded by nature, and I think so. That's where it must have started from, and uh, getting into sustainability was it was probably an interesting one because. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. And mm. even to the point my A-levels were maths, physics, and chemistry just because I was good at them, not because I was interested in them in any way, particular way. Uh, when I was ready to choose a degree for university, of which I had to do a HND because I flunked my A-levels, I, um, I, uh, I, would, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I, I thought, well, my cousin is abroad in Borneo, so he's traveling and he's earning mm. lots of money. I'll do civil engineering. That was, his, that was, that was it. That was the decision. And it, I kind of fell into sustainability because back then in the 90s, you know, there was no sustainability degree and there was mm. no sustainability sector. So yeah. it was hardly surprising I didn't quite know, you know, what to do because there was nothing there to really put a pin on the donkey, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and it so. <sighs> Long story short, went off, did that. Civil engineering wasn't for me. Did a design technology business degree, which is really interesting, a bit of industrial mm. design, a bit of engineering in, in the business. Um, but in the background, I was working for a contractor who was doing fitting um, exhaust extraction systems across London Underground, Martin Baker Aircraft in various places, factories and things. So it's on, uh, hands-on sort of building services, um, contracting work. And when I finished my degree i moved long story short moved eight times moved to bristol i didn't have a i had bought a car that was the only car in the paper that was uh, uh, for sale over christmas put all my stuff in it moved to a friend of a friend's house in st george region um nothing was stolen out of the car for four days even though it's not the uh not the the, <laughs> the, the best place in a uh, location in Bristol. That, that's a miracle. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to be too real. I mean, I, I lived in Bristol for 16 years, I think I mentioned, and to leave leave stuff in your car for, for one day and have, not having nicked in uh, St. George is, uh, is pretty impressive. So, uh, mm. I, don't know, I don't know what it says about the stuff that you had in the car. <laughs> well, exactly. Either it says it was a load of rubbish or someone thought it might have been dumped anyway. So, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, funny. So, I, I, yeah, there for four days and then a, fr- a friend's sister had a, sp- a place to stay. And in the interim, I applied for 50 industrial design jobs and didn't even get an interview. You know, so I was kind of plucking at straws and uh, I decided just to go for a building service job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I applied for three jobs. I think if I remember it was Kennedy and Donkin, Arup, and maybe um, there was one other. Anyway, I got offered all three. I'm um, just off the back of the experience that I'd had with Ken, uh, with um, Harmel Systems, the mm. industrial extraction systems company. So that's how I ended up as a building services engineer. And of course, building services, mechanical engineering, you know, 50% of, of your energy efficiency is usually, you know, focused on that, on that mm. services and the plant. Uh, so I worked there, went traveling came to Australia and uh, worked for Bassett, uh, Bassett Consulting Engineers um, for, Ka- for David Callier. And um, 
at the time, about six months in, there was an opportunity to assist um, Lester Partridge setting up uh, Bassett Applied Research, which was their mm. sustainability arm. And this was about 2001, so just before the rating tools had come out, but there was much more of an emphasis on on sustainability. I think Brianne might have might have been out by then. The lead certainly was out, the lead rating mm. tools. And that was the start of my sustainability career. So I couldn't have planned it in any way because there just wasn't anything around at the time. Mm. Uh, and back then, you know, there was there were no roadmaps. There was no tools available. You, someone would ask, oh, how do we do this? Have no idea. You can't look it up. Yeah. Just sort of try and, you know, figure it out yourself. Uh, and been in sustainability ever since. Oh, fantastic. Um, you mentioned uh, your sort of special places to go and get some headspace, um, you know, in, in the UK. Um, I'm, uh, it's completely unsustainability related, but just wondering, where, where, where are your places in Australia? Where do you go? Uh, well, immediately in the, in the immediate vicinity, we'll be surfing. Yeah. Surfing is amazing because you get your fitness, but you're out sitting out in the waves, you know, mm. away from it all. Uh just it's just a great downtime as long as there's not too many aggressive crowds around obviously but you know you yeah. can see some amazing stuff out there you just you know you can just float around on your own and 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 i still i saw some research around you know how the mind someone um put sensors on someone's um mind when they were surfing mm. apparently there's the same brain um, wave as if someone's meditating because you just yeah. have to be in so focused on what's happening it's a it's a little bit it's a bit like skiing and snowboarding but but with skiing and snowboarding hopefully there's only one thing moving that's you down mm. the slope otherwise you're in trouble if there's more than one thing moving yeah you're in an avalanche <laughs> um, but, but with 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 um surfing you're moving because you're falling down the wave, but the wave's moving as well. So you have mm. to be completely in the zone to try and to, you know, to surf. And so I find it really, really relaxing. Uh, mm. And we'll escape up to Bluey's a couple of times a year, Bluey's Beach Louise. up the up the coast. It's great options for surfing, mm. uh, you know, depending on the swell and the conditions. Uh, and then with the family, we'll try and find some camp spots that are, you know, away from away from the from the city and away from um, the crowds mm. and go and find something that's in, you know, free national parks out, out West or, mm. or, or Northwest, you know, yeah. there's some great spots around Australia. Yeah. That, uh, well worth a visit. So. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. So um, um, one thing I was keen to sort of talk to you about is we, we, I think sustainability has become one of those words that is used a lot, isn't it? And we talk about um, in the industry about sustainability, sustainability in buildings, sustainability in infrastructure, um, and it's included in a, you know a lot of conversations and the sort of um, buzzwords and what have you. But um, I thought what would be interesting is if can you can you put a framework around it? You know, when we talk about sustainability, what should we be focusing on and thinking about and um, and you know to create something that is sustainable as such. Mm. Well, it's simplistic. Simplistically, so what is sustainability? Sustainability is either doing the same or more with less. You know, mm. it's, that's all it is, really. It's taking what you've got and finding better ways of doing things, improving the quality of something with using the same amount of less materials or resources. So, mm. I mean, that, that's really the focus of what sustainability is all about. And, you know, we, we do live in a finite world and we are um, the focus, you know, we are at the moment using it unsustainable using our resources unsustainably mm. uh, and so there needs to be a focus on, on accounting for externalities you know those waste streams that aren't that aren't being used and, and recycled and and um, redistributed into our into our whole materials life cycle mm. processes um but in terms of in terms of a framework you've got to start with your vision you know simon sinek said it the best you know he says you know start with why Mm. And it's, it, it's so true. In, irrespective of what you're doing, you need to have that that sustainability, that vision, um, even even if it's a sustainability vision. And if you don't have the vision and the target set at the start, then whatever follows doesn't have a clear direction, transparency about what the reasons people are doing things and what, why they're doing them. And it all mm. sorts of sort of falls in a heap. Uh, you know, I've been involved in buildings, uh, you know, for 
20 odd years now. And 10, over 10 years ago, I realized that one building at a time just wasn't fast enough, which is mm. part of the reason, you know, for, for the great fit with, with KPMG because of the strategy side of things. We need to ratchet up and underpin those strategies. Uh, so you've got to, you've got to set your vision. Mm. And, and then set targets that are smart, you know, those specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. I know it's been said a million times before, but there's so many targets that have been set for, for greenhouse gas emissions or, or waste or water in the past that no one knows why they've been set. Mm. They're not underpinned by anything that's, that's reasonable. So the whole thing gets is, you know, team starts off disillusioned and doesn't and frustrated, doesn't understand how to get there and then, you know, it just just doesn't work. The best projects that I've seen have got that vision set right at the start. Uh, you know, a good example would be number one, Bly Street. You know, when um, when I work when we worked on that project with Kundal back with um, Tim Elgood, Simon Wilds back in two thousand five, two thousand six, I think it was DB Reef at the time before Dexas, before they rebranded. They. Um, well, we had a workshop at the start of it and saying, well, what do you want out of this building? You know, and there were a few key things that came out. It was the highest level of IQ possible, um, r- really high energy efficiency in the building, uh, and hu- and the highest rents in town. And mm-hmm. obviously, had to pay for the whole thing, but it was it was part of the. And this this little spread, this little matrix that was set up right at the very start, stayed with the project all the way through. And what it did was every time there was a potential value management exercise and someone said, oh, we're going to be moving that double skin facade because, you know, it's too expensive. So, well, hang on, your IEQ was one of your key tenants that you needed to stick to to make this, this building work. Go look for savings elsewhere because you can't touch mm. that, that element. What's, what's IEQ? Oh, the indoor environment quality. Yeah. Good. So, yeah. you know, with having double skin facade, it gives you good energy efficiency for good daylight at the same time, uh, as an example. So, uh, yeah, making sure that there's the target, the vision is set. But because there's so many stakeholders involved, right from planning all the way through to operations, you've got to ensure that that vision is refreshed. And, you know, uh, enrolling people in that vision as you go through the process to ensure that the, that the communication is 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 clear all the way through. Um, the other good example was when we were working with Shipper, the uh, Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority, in assisting them to set the targets for Barangaroo before Land Lease developed. They wanted to know well, what can they set as a target without devaluing without the developers thinking that you know devalue the land because the targets were so potentially unobtainable. Mm. So the process we went through was we, we looked at each asset class at the time, which was about 2008, 2009, and looked at, well, what's best practice? And so if we take an office building, was four and a half star Australian building greenhouse rating scheme at the time, Neighbours now. Mm. Um, that's, that's best practice. That's what we're normally designing to. If we want to go to five star, what do you normally need to do? Well, you might add you know, uh, better technology in your facade and your envelope, or you might add a bit better technology in terms of your building services. Mm. What do you need to do to get to five star plus 20, as, as it was back then, or five and a half star now? Well, you might need to add both of those in. Um, the next thing is probably some add-ons onto your to your building. Take that further, you're starting to look at precinct-wide systems and then to bridge the gap, solar farms or something that's off-site that would be able mm. to get you to, to a net zero target. And in carrying out that process with a cost planner involved, you were actually able to cost what the difference was between best practice to your target you were going to achieve. So you had some robust figures around what it was going to cost and therefore there was no, when someone came back to refute that target, you had a standing point. You, know, you had an argument to stand on um, and it was all set on, you know, on robust um, figures. Mm. And now we know that, you know, Barangaroo and Lindley have done a fantastic job at getting there and Barangaroo Development Authority to, to the net zero, you know, targets that they've, they've been wanting to achieve. Mm. Uh, and now, you know, it's, it demonstrates that it's possible and achievable. Back then, you know, everyone was doubting whether you, you could or, or couldn't do it. But mm. um, the technology is here right now for us to move to a net zero world. It's just mm. there are, you know, there's certain... Um, resistance because of 
the large commercial decisions that are made around coal and we're exporting, you know, I think it's two thirds of GDP is is around our exports. Mm. Not just coal, but our, but around our exports. And so that mm. is has you know, has the ear of the government essentially with lobbying. Mm. And you know, everyone knows that in the industry in this case. And but businesses are taking the lead. And New South mm. Wales government now, you've seen we would have seen the announcements of committing to net zero, which is fantastic to see. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so they're the, they're the key ones. Is really you know making sure that you when uh, and and that was the appeal with working with KPMG. They're they're busy working with big organisations, setting the targets, and we can assist them with in, with underpinning those targets with empirical uh, analysis and data to yeah. to be able to achieve what we need to do on a grand scale. Yeah, fantastic. I was actually um, it was my uh, partner's birthday, and we were, we were down in Barangaroo on Friday night, and. Um, uh, we, we got there sort of about six, half past six sort of thing. And it's just cracking down there. It's so good. And, um, um, the, the, you know, the, the sh- shared toilets everywhere, which is their part of their sort of, um, uh, um, net zero, isn't it? Um, um, to, to, to their ecological sort of, um, um, things, what have you. But, um, it's, um, it's such a good place down there. And now COVID's kind of lifted for us as well. There's such a buzz about it. Fantastic. Mm. Um, precinct. Um, we keep hearing that um, uh, COVID is going to be a catalyst, um, that it's going to drive um, or accelerate sort of sustainable initiatives, um, and um, and particularly sort of in the, with with renewables and things that are uh, energy associated with that. Um, what what, what um, you know what, what what do you see coming in the future? What, what are the um, what's the what's the pace of change and the and the differences that we're going to see because of COVID? Do, do you see any? Or is, 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 is there stuff on the horizon? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I, I definitely think it has really. Uh, there's been some 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 great some great examples through this this tra- fairly traumatic experience, and certainly traumatic for a lot of people. Um, we, we've been pretty lucky here in Australia, and, you know. Although there have been a few people that touched by by the by this pandemic, uh, you know. And it, luckily, for myself personally speaking, we're pretty lucky to work in a white collar, you know, part of the industry where construction has just continued to to go on. And I certainly feel for anyone who's been in retail and hospitality and the arts, where they've just been absolutely hammered, especially small business in retail. Yeah. You know where the wall is, the coals are raking it in, and at the other, in, you know, in Amazon, and at the other end of the scale, they're absolutely getting getting hammered. So, um, but but what you remember, you know, early on in the piece when everything ground to a halt, we actually started to see blue sky, mm. and you know, I, I, hopefully that doesn't get forgotten too quickly. But that's you know a direct result of traffic emissions, and so mm. the faster we can speed up. Um, our transition to electric vehicles, even though the noise out there at the moment has actually put a tax on electric vehicles because, you know, um, we're not subs- – electric vehicles won't be subsidising the oil industry. Mm. So backwards, it's unbelievable. But that really needs to happen, but not just because of net zero, but, of course, air quality. Mm. Uh, we, we're absolutely seeing a push towards net zero. There's been lots and lots of targets being set. Uh, with organisations now because of of this. And, you know, I wrote a post about four months or so ago around COVID. COVID COVID is a, is a symptom of a system out of balance. You know, mm. we have a cause and effect. And I think one of the problems that we, we seem to fall into consistently, um, continually, and just g- generally speaking as a, as, a, as a society is we find a symptom um, and, and a problem when we try and address that, when it might not be the underlying cause. Mm. You know, and if you look at climate change, climate change is actually a similar thing, although it does need to be addressed as well. What is climate change? Well, climate change is, is us burning resources that, um, you know, in, in an unsustainable way. However, the underlying cause is, is you know, consumerism. Mm. So what we really need to do is not only address climate change and burning energy, but we actually need to address the consumerism mm. focus and, and the materialism that yeah. um, is is under, underpinning the whole energy increase. Mm. So uh, definitely net zero has been a huge one. EVs, there's you know, we really need to embrace that from not only from an energy perspective, but 
also you know, that will assist us in having a a, um, a distributed grid. Mm. Uh, and and yes, there's there's issues with the grid, but the utilities need to you know increase their um, their um, their processes in in making the grid a little bit more flexible. You know, uh, I can understand their pain in terms of when you look at the whole energy supply. 100 or so, 150 years ago, you'd have a power station in the middle of London, pea super mm. fogs, you know, because of the particulates, because of the coal dust everywhere, really bad pollution, couldn't see mm. a metre ahead of you. The problem was move the, co- move the power stations out, out of the city. Technology mm. allowed us to do that because we had we invented high voltage um, systems and we could put the power station 100 kilometres away. Nowadays, obviously, and Unfortunately, you get a loss. You know, you only get, you get to use forty percent if you're lucky mm. of that usable uh, energy within the coal or the fuel source that you're burning. But now, of course, we know that that's an issue, and distributed energy is better. I mean, when you think about most of the power sources in a the house, they're usually twelve or twenty-four volt. Mm. So, when you're generating on the roof at the same level, you've got very little power. Um, losses coming from there straight down in DC because the runs are so so much shorter. Mm. But of course, when you're exporting to the grid, if you think about it like a a tap, originally all energy came from a power station fed one way out to all the homes distributed. Now if you, and so to make a substation kiosk or or the like safe for a a Osgrid worker, you would just have to turn a tap off above between you and the power station. Mm. Now, you need hardware installed in the grid to be able to make safe from every direction. And yeah. so that's, that's the key problem, one of the key mm. problems of the grid. And funnily enough, no one, no one understands. The, re- the only feedback that these, the networks get of whether they're you know, providing enough power or not is when someone calls up and says they haven't got any. It's such a, right? <laughs> it's such a dumb system that that's the only feedback that they get. So they just you know, power up. And this is where the, the, the generators are getting caught out a lot of the time with, you know, we've had a number of spot prices that have gone zero, gone negative over in Queensland where there's been so much renewable being put into the grid that it actually costs the generator, the big generators, because they can't turn their, they can't turn their systems off. You can't turn a you know, gas-fired power station or a coal-fired power station off overnight. It takes, you know, days and weeks to yeah. get up get up and running so it, it's a really fascinating um scenario but that's part of the problem and what's slowing down the um, you know really embracing a distributed um grid and and of course the vested interests you know anyone who's in a commercial position on this and has vested interest in, in running a business wants mm-hmm. to make sure that they hold on to their you know, make sure that they've got a going concern, uh, mm. which is frustrating when we know that it's the direction where everyone needs to go in. Yeah. Thank you so much. Look, it's been awesome talking to you and um, and 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 um, spending a bit of time talking about sustainability and um, and hearing a few of your personal stories as well. And congratulations again on 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 the, on the business and joining KPMG. It's fantastic. Um, we, we we always try and finish um, on a, a positive note. Um, not that we haven't sort of been talking about positive things, but um, um, really um, um, lo- love to know what you're sort of um, what what you're looking forward to at the moment. What are you um, 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 excited about? Yeah, as I said before, a holiday. <laughs> it's been a long, tw- uh, probably 18 months, probably more, really. It's been yeah, pretty full on. Uh, the, just running an SME in the first place is, is pretty hectic. And then uh, the whole acquisition process and then COVID on top, building a house, uh, everything. On to, you know, it's been, been full on. So get having a holiday. Looking forward to a good break over Christmas. Um, but there's some great, I uh, say, you know, KPMG has got some great opportunities that come walking through the door. One of the big ones that I think is, is a great opportunity is working with Scott Valentine, who's, um, who's a director in sustainability. He's, he's an expert in circular economy. He used to work, um, he used to be at the RMIT. And, uh, and so there's some great 
initiatives there that that he's driving and and looking forward to getting involved in underpinning those and and assisting uh assisting him getting some of these uh, opportunities up and running um, because the, that's more of a sort of an industry you know, systems type change and mm-hmm. that's really where we need to get to with with construction as well the other big thing i'd like to leave it with is is that we really need nat- we need to embrace natural capital we need to value it in our cities and at the moment, it's it's under an economic model, model that if it doesn't, if you can't put a cost on it, a value on it, then it becomes zero in your um, on your spreadsheet. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean by natural capital? Just explain that for us. Ability for everyone to have uh, access to natural spaces, natural green. Mm. So natural green spaces as well as recreational green spaces. Mm. You know, there's so many studies out there that show that we we uh, recover better. If we have used the green spaces, uh, if we can walk in, it comes to mind. Mm. You know, uh, in in Scotland, in the, in the Outer Hebrides, uh, I think they've actually you can actually be prescribed walks in nature for dealing with um, depression and um, uh, you know um, health and well-being issues. Mm. Uh, so it's recognised in in medical um, circles that the green space is is beneficial to our mm. To our well-being, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so I believe that the planning system really needs to change to be able to really account for that and ensure mm. that we have larger tracts of natural um, land. We're really lucky in Sydney because we do have so much already. Yeah, um, but some of these gro- growth areas, northwest, southwest growth areas, aren't considering it uh, in not nearly as much as they need to. Yeah, um, and and so that's something that I'm really keen on, you know, yeah. driving is, is how we get that change because it's a big, a bit, again, it's just almost a systems change for yeah. people to recognise this. But but if we are looking for a sustainable world, then that's the, that's the way to go. Yeah. And the other thing is to, to note is, um, you know, there were, we've got so much land that's being degraded. We were, I think we're second after Brazil in terms of land clearing in Australia. Mm. If only we turned that around, we could, we could really tackle a lot of our uh, climate issues by just restoring the, the land and restorative yeah. farming methodologies and you know sustainable farming methodologies as well as as um, restoring degraded land. There's there's mm-hmm. so much opportunity there, and it doesn't take a lot much and doesn't take long for it to for nature to you know to change its course and and start to thrive. So. So the you know we we talk about um, you know these issues and what have you and um, I had Alison Myrams on from Robert Pizzarotti in the last podcast and we were talking about um, where the influence and pressure comes from and it needing to come from the the bottom up and and, and the top down as well in terms of, of affecting um, change. Um, where do you see you know if if somebody's um, listening to the podcast and thinking, "Crikey, I really really agree with what you know Alistair just said there." How does somebody get involved and um, help apply some pressure or have an influence on these things apart from potentially at the ballot box where they probably actually won't end up having any influence because you can never vote these the types of initiatives in? But where, where do people get involved and um, either learn or you know um, influence? Yeah, uh, to influence is, is an interesting one. I mean, there's so many groups that are looking to, you know, uh, there's so many social groups out there that are that are fighting different battles on different fronts. Mm. Generally speaking, it's against big business and commercial commercial decisions. Um, so you don't have to Google very far you know, to find out. Reach out. It's I mean, we're such a connected world that if you don't know where to look, then ask someone. Ask someone mm. who's in your LinkedIn feed. You know, most people are more than more than happy to 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 reach out and assist. And, and I remember um, when I was when I was writing the book a few years ago, uh, it I was just reaching. I was reach, uh, reading a a, a book uh, by. Um, uh, it was um, dis- Samet, um, Jay Samet, Disrupt Yourself. Mm. Mm. And uh, and I was connected to him on Twitter. And I remember just thinking, I read a really, really insightful part of the book and it was really, really um, re- refreshing to read. And I just 
I was at that point where I just I flicked him a tweet and said, look, re- really, thanks for your book finding me right now. It's been really inspirational. And literally 20 seconds later, I got a tweet back. I wasn't expecting anything from it. I just wasn't asking for anything. I just thought, you know, create, you know, creates work is due. And, and from that point, it's, wow, this connection. I, I'm writing a book right now where, you know, would you be interested in a transcript? Because I was looking for case studies to assist mm. in, 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 you know, um, supporting what a, a successful business looks like. What are the tenets to make a successful business? What are the things that you need to build in? And uh, he, he tweeted back saying, "Look, I, I, I wouldn't, I won't write a transcript, but I'll, I'm happy to have an interview." Mm-hmm. So two weeks later, I'm. Um, Got an hour-long interview with this amazing American tech disruptor that has done mm. many things in his life and is still going. Um, but one of the things was getting computers in every school in, in the US. Mm. You know, from to try and um, balance the uh, the educational um, uh, imbalances of learning between you know different types of, of schooling in, in the US system uh, was mm. one of his. You know, he worked for. Uh, he worked all through the Napster years with Sony and with um, um, some of the huge companies looking at their disruptions of, of you know, industry where you went from you know, mu- music on CDs to music, digital music, et cetera. Mm. Amazing guy. But I was just reaching out. Yeah. So if anyone's looking to see where they can assist, we're so connected, just reach out. And most reach people out. are really more than happy to to help out. Yeah, Thank fantastic. As uh, you were uh, when I asked you if you wanted to come and have a chat on the podcast, so I really appreciate that. Um, um, tell us about Pleasure. your book. Yeah, so again, this comes from that that really that decision or that uh, that position where I thought, well, I, you know, what buildings are great, and you know, built we need sustainable buildings, but one building at a time isn't fast enough, and actually, it's the organisations in the building that need change because. It's not just the building developers, but the developers themselves are organisations, right? So mm. where where do we enact the change? What does we have a uh, a current philosophy around of success in business, which is purely financial? How, what, how do we measure success? It's all about you know profits and growth and capex, uh, and and is that really you know a reasonable yardstick for what success actually means Mm. and so the book is really around well okay here's my journey on what sustainability is and how sustainability can affect us both in the built environment uh and health and well-being um and and i you know i think most of our problems fall down for two things we have a separation from community and we have a separation from nature the the you know the lots of the issues that we have can be attributable to those type those things. So, the book is around you know what makes a sustainable building, but then what what can we do? What can we do in those buildings to actually make it make a benefit and make make it better? And I did a lot of research around it. I read a lot about you know as I say with Jay Summit and interviews around the world and mm. looked looked for case studies of businesses that are doing something a bit different, whether it be a six hour day or a, you know. A, um, uh, four-day work weeks, or or whether it be you know Netflix, for example, saying all their all their staff can have endless holidays. You mm-hmm. know, there's no limit to the holidays. Uh, what that really does for the for the organisations themselves, and what it what it does to build trust for the employees, mm-hmm. because very few people are bending the rules there, and and that and that fits fits really well into COVID times where businesses have had to trust their staff mm. or should we say white collar again? Cause let's not forget there's a yeah. lot of people out there that are blue workers, blue collar mm. workers that are in construction sites or in factories that haven't had a, haven't had a break, yeah. you know, and they don't yeah. get recognized at all. They're still flowering on just as, and as you know, nothing's changed for them. Taking more but risks as a, um, through COVID than they would do previously. Well, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but in the in the sort of in the professional services industry, companies have had to trust the staff because they've had to work from home. Mm. Uh, and and I think hopefully and thankfully, and I think you were saying that um, Alison Mirams was echoing this that they, mm. you know, she really embraces the flexible working. Mm. 
I range in. Um, yeah. Because it makes sense. If you if you have staff that are going to bend the rules and you're managing them by timesheets, you know, getting them to stay in the office from eight till six, I can guarantee you they're not working from eight till six. They're probably mm-hmm. looking at Facebook and Googling stuff for two or three of those hours if they're going to be, you know, unproductive and bending the rules anyway. So it doesn't matter yeah. where they sit. And timesheet management is is pretty poor method of managing work. It's got to be around KPIs. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, where, where, where can we uh, find your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, um, how to achieve um, it's the conscious business? How to achieve profit with purpose? All right, brilliant. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, but that, mm. that's awesome. And um, I, I feel like we got through the bits we, we were going to talk about, and then we just started talking about even more cool stuff and sort of just scratched the surface. So um, 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 I feel like we could uh, come back and have another chat some other time as well. But um, I really appreciate. Yeah, fantastic. Really appreciate your time, Alistair. And um, um, good luck for 2021 and for, um, for for you and KPMG and all of your colleagues. And, um, and I hope you have a really good holiday and a good break. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Much appreciated. And thanks for the opportunity. Uh, absolute pleasure. Good to talk to you. See you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Integrated infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property, and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.